this is something that we haven't done at past workshops. And so I apologize ahead of time if um, if we lose some people, but at the same time, I hope we gain some people, some people that's maybe just what they're looking for. Um, this is going to be an under the hood tour of what's going on in the source code of VSB. It's a big code base. We're not going to have time for everything, but I hope to get you um, a guided tour that will hopefully help you find your way if you ever come back. So I'm Rob McDonald, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. So first, Justin Grabbit did a great job last year of doing a follow along tutorial of how to compile uh, OpenVSP on Windows. And most of our users are Windows users, so we're not going to repeat that for Mac or for Linux. Um, but if you want to see how to compile it, go to last year. He's got his video and, and his slides are a great step by step walkthrough of how to compile. Uh, he also talked about how to make contributions with Git. And um, we don't have time to really get into uh, Git usage here today. So we're not going to we're not going to bounce on that too much. We're also not going to get super in depth into CMake or Swig or some of the other tools that we use. What we are going to try and do is just give everybody a guided tour through the source code. Like I said, to hope helpfully find your way if you ever make a wrong turn and end up in the source code sometime in the future. So with that, um, sort of the top view of the source repository is a whole bunch of directories. And I've, I've done this exploded tree view and we're going to walk through a bunch of these um, in general. We have a directory that contains a bunch of external libraries, uh, some examples, and then most of the source, which also has some code that we call external. It's not really developed by the core developers. And then over here on the right is sort of the things that really are developed by the core developers. So it can be daunting, but we're going to walk through a lot of this and hopefully help make some sense of what's going on here. For the record, the code that really is sort of core VSP, that sort of we own ourselves, um, is about 250,000 lines of code. So that's not small, it's, it's a big package. Um, I'm counting everything over here in this source directory. So none of the, none of the external contributions of that, about 45,000 lines of code is VSP arrow and it's solver and slicer and viewer. So if you took that out, maybe, maybe VSP itself is back down to about 200,000 lines of code, um, but there's an exception I'll talk about a little bit later. One of these libraries over here that's that's hidden away is really our own core source code um, called Code Eli. So we'll 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 add that back in. But in any case, this is a this is a big project, and uh, hopefully this tour will help people find their way if they uh, if they need to. First, let's talk a little bit about the tool chain, the things that you need in order to build and develop on VSP. Again, we're not we're not walking through the process, but I wanted to just give some give some words to these, make sure everybody understands. We use CMake as a cross platform build tool. And what that means is CMake is a meta build tool. We use it to build our build files. So if you've ever worked in uh, Visual Studio, you know that you have visual project files. CMake makes those project files. Or if you've ever worked in a Unix type environment and you've used make files, CMake makes the make files. And it's really essential to us so that we can work in a cross-platform way. We can, we can manage one set of CMake files and that allows us to build on different platforms and different build systems. We use Git as a version control system and we host on GitHub. And so that's where the source code is, is hosted and where we share and where we merge different contributions. And if you want to get the latest, greatest source code, that's where you go. You go to GitHub, you need to know how to use Git and pull that down. You're going to need a C++ compiler that supports C++ 11. Uh, pretty much any compiler will support that these days. Um, and we regularly compile with GCC, Microsoft, CLang, and Xcode. So I know that people in the past have built with Intel C++. I, I don't have access to it. I think it'll work fine, but I haven't tried it lately. And if you're going to build anything on VSP, you need, you've got to have these three. There's some additional tools, which are I want to call optional. We use something called Swig, which is a wrapper interface generator. That's what takes our C++ API and turns it into something that Python and MATLAB can, can build against. And so 
if you want to develop and you are going to be developing to the API to either Python or MATLAB or Java or something like that, you're going to need to install Swig on your computer as well. And if you're doing that, you also, of course, need the corresponding Python and MATLAB that you're going to work with. Um, another optional thing in the build tool chain is Doxygen. This is a documentation generator. This is how we generate the API documentation that's on the website. Um, the only reason you need Doxygen is if you want to make your own documentation. So you don't really need to install it, but if you're making changes to the API and then you're making changes to the documentation, then and you want to check to make sure that the documentation came out the way you wanted it, then you're going to want Doxygen installed and you're going to be able to use that to process and generate the HTML documentation. Here's a little secret that most people don't know. If you're at the command line and you run VSP with a dash doc, it'll actually run and generate these three files, which constitute the documentation that what we use to process and create the documentation for the API. There's a little readme. There's an actual script which will run the example code in every single API doc. So you notice every every API documentation, every routine has a little example. That code gets pulled out and you can run it as a script. And then this openvspas.h, there's an underscore here that you can't see. Uh, this is actually what gets processed by Doxygen to turn into that documentation. So this header file, it's not really a header file, but it looks like one. And that's what all our documentation is generated from. There's a couple of different ways to build. I'll, I'll fly through this. Um, but basically, CMake follows instructions, and those instructions are always found in a CMake list text file. And if you use, if you're doing a CMake project, you're going to find there's going to be one of these CMake list files in almost every directory. They're they're littered all over the place because one will call another and will call another. In OpenVSP, there's really four ways to start. You can think of this as four front doors to get into our build process. There's a CMake list in the external libraries in the libraries directory, and that's only going to do the external libraries. We have a super project which builds both the libraries and VSP in one go. There's the source, which builds VSP and VSP arrow. And then we've got sort of this top level wrapper, which is really just a redirect to the source. Um, and that's probably the one that I recommend a lot. If you're just porting VSP to a computer where you're not gonna be hacking on the code, but you just need VSP to compile on some machine for some reason, then you, then you might wanna use the super project because it should do it all in one step. You're not gonna be getting too much under the hood and it should be a pretty direct thing. Unfortunately, the developers hardly ever use it, so it doesn't get tested very often, so it occasionally breaks. And if it does fail, then use one of the other front doors. If you're a developer where you're gonna be really getting into the code and rolling up your sleeves, then I recommend you build the library separately from the project. And that way, what that does is it means that every time you build the project, you don't have to go back and rebuild the libraries you don't even have to check if they need to be rebuilt. It'll just assume that they haven't been changed and you can just focus on the source. So it makes a more efficient process if you work with them separately. And then if you choose this top level entry point, it'll allow your, your IDE like Visual Studio to see all of the files. It'll let you see the libraries and the examples. It'll let you see, it really means that if you start at the top level, your IDE will see everything in this tree Whereas if you start and you start with putting your IDE here at source, you'll only see everything from here down. And this stuff up here will be invisible to your IDE. And I like to be able to see the examples in my IDE. So I recommend you start with this top level redirect. Now that libraries directory has a bunch of external libraries. So when I was counting up that 300,000, 250,000 lines of code earlier, that's not counting other people's code that we count on and we rely on to be correct that we didn't write. These are just other people's code that we're using. And we kind of have a different relationship with different projects. So there's a bunch of projects that we pretty much treat as a black box. We don't get around, we don't poke around in the source. We just take it as good. Um, we don't modify it. We try to keep up to date when they release new versions but we don't, we don't mess with them. We're not involved in their user communities, anything like that. And that includes things like, well, everything in this list here. We have something I'm gonna call a gray box, which these are things where we might go in and make a change occasionally. 
we participate some in their user communities. Um, we were a little bit more up to date and a little bit more involved, but we really still don't own these. And the two biggest examples of this are, are libigis and step code. These are the libraries that allow us to write out IGIS and step files. And it's been important for us to be involved because these are both really young projects that are really small and we were some of the first users of them. And so when we when we started using them, they were broken and we had to help them, you know, find bugs and debug and get things working. So we've been involved in libigis and step code. FLTK um, is, is the library that we use to create our GUI. That's all the buttons and the windows and the scroll bars and things like that. And so we're, we're pretty just intimately connected to that. And so we, we have to stay up to date with FLTK's changes. And again, we've, we've occasionally found bugs that we've had to work with that community to fix. So we have a little bit more intimate relationship with these than we do the others. And then we've got two where I, where I call them no box. And what that means is that these two are really, even though we've placed them in this external libraries directory, they're not external. These are really just a part of OpenBSP's code that we've just organized differently. One is the expression parser that makes smart update work. I don't know if we talked about smart update. Um, it's just a little algebra parser that does addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, things like that. And then code Eli, this is the big one. Our, our really low level, our Bezier curves and surfaces, our hardcore math, that's all done in code Eli. So that's about 70,000 lines of code that we really own, even though it's located in here in these external libraries. Now we call them internal libraries, sort of, I'm saying it here, I'm saying it's internal because it's in the main build, not the library's build, but they're in the external directory, they're in source external. And we have, again, there's a bunch of these things that do different, different functions for us. And we have a similar relationship. Some of them are that distant black box. We just take them as a given and we really don't touch their source or interact with them. We have some that are more gray box where we have, you know, closer interaction. We've had to make changes. Uh, we interact and, and you may occasionally need to have deeper knowledge of these in order to work. And then we have some what we call no box where these are really things that we own. We've just put there. So, for example, the NACA 6 series airfoil generator is actually um, a, a C code that we've converted from the Fortran to do the math for uh, six series airfoil. So that's an original NASA code for that. And then likewise, we have a an Edmonton Lord that uh, Fourier series computation I was talking about yesterday. The code that does that is um, is in this little area. But th these are both pretty small, but we really own both of these. Nobody else. Uh, they're not an external project. They're just organized here. Of course, there's VSP Arrow, and that's in that source directory located in VSP underscore Arrow with Slicer Solver and Viewer as separate directories. And, you know, the VSP source code, source code is completely separate of VSP. Um, it's not sharing any files or linking across it. It's a separate thing. And, you know, we use CMake to build it, but Dave Kinney, he does it using handwritten make files. Um, and he's building on Linux only. So that means the VSP team integrates that into our build system and makes it work with CMake and makes it work across platform. Um, the viewer does use two of the libraries from the rest of the framework. It uses those STB libraries for uh, writing in writing PNG files uh, for screenshots and animations. And it also uses FLTK. <clears throat> and so that's that GUI library for the buttons and the scroll bars. So it uses that. And when you're building it from CMake, it gets it from our project. If you're going to build it using Dave's make files, then you have to provide the STB image file and the FLTK stuff. You have to provide that yourself in order to make the make files work. Um, it's a VSP arrow. The solver itself is a little bit tricky, and that's because it uses OpenMP to get multi-threaded versions. And the problem with that is then there's certain extra libraries that need to be bundled or that need to exist in order for the OpenMTB to then run on the ultimate user's computer. And Windows, there's there's a trick in CMake to help us grab those DLLs. And so you'll notice there's some weird named DLLs in the zip file that come along with VSP. Those are gonna be the OpenMP DLLs on Windows. On Linux, the OpenMP libraries are usually installed. Everybody's computer's got them it's fine or GCC has the ability to statically link those libraries so we can we can tightly bundle it. 
on a Mac, it's it's a hassle because most of the time, uh, OpenMP libraries are not installed, and the the CLang Xcode does not support static linking. So we've had to work around this in the past, where we'll actually use a second compiler. If you compile most of VSP with Clang or Xcode, then on a Mac, we're actually going to use GCC to compile VSPRO itself, and that's all about this OpenMP stuff. So you'll notice there's some complication if you dive in in what's going on with CMake here and the compilers around VSP Arrow. Okay, if you're working in the API bindings, there's these two directories for the MATLAB API and the Python API, and these include some files that go to Swig. And so if Swig is installed, then you can build these things. It'll then also look for the Python or MATLAB to do it. Um, and the bindings are based on the API on the C++ side. And then we also have the AngelScript version. So th these two need to match, and that's a little bit of a manual process. So it's possible for us to leave some things out that we put into the AngelScript API, but we forget to add to the C++ API. So we need to watch for that. But detailed instructions on how to do this were given by Justin back in those slides. And the result of this binding is either a, a DLL or a shared object file that basically puts all of VSP into a file that then the scripting language can call. You need to be a little careful because these need to match. If you're using, you know, 64-bit Python, but 32-bit VSP, it's not going to work. So you need to match, you know, if it's Python 3 versus another one's Python 2, they're not going to work. So you have to match it up, and we try and do that. We're currently bundling Python 3.6 on Windows and Mac, and then on Ubuntu, we use whatever the Python that system installed is, and that's what we try and target. Hopefully that works for most people, but 3.6 is getting a little bit long in the tooth. So, you know, comment in the questions if you think we should update to a newer Python. Okay, now we're finally getting to VSB itself, right? That's just been some of the ancillaries and around the edges. So the main part of the VSP cord kind of comes into these, these directories here, and, and I'm gonna start we're in version three now, but first I'm going to talk a little bit about version two and before, sort of the ancient history. In the ancient history of VSP in this box in the upper right, if you think about three main functions of VSP, three roles that needed to be done, there's sort of the geometry math itself, the thing that actually figures out, given parameters, where is the wing surface, where is the pod surface. So that's the geometry. There's the GUI, that's, you know, the buttons and the sliders and making it interactive for the user. And then we've got the 3D graphics, everything that goes into that big window where we show you the model, where we show you the airplane. And what I'm trying to represent with this Venn diagram up here is in V2, this code was inseparable. It was all together in the same source code, sometimes in the same functions. You'd have one update routine and it would come and at the start, it would update and it would do some of the math for the geometry. And then it would update the buttons in the GUI for the for the geom window, and then it would update the 3D graphics. And so this code was all together as a big uh, mashup. And when we did the rewrite to go from V2 to V3, one of the big goals was to break this apart, was to separate these. And the reason is that if you're working on a high performance computer, like a supercomputer, there's oftentimes you don't have the ability to have graphics libraries. Things like OpenGL will not be allowed to be installed on that computer. And other libraries that go with that won't be able to go along. And so we had to separate this. And so version three, we had to separate the geometry from the GUI and the graphics. And I, I've driven, drawn this broken yellow line here with the gray behind it. Think of this like a road. And what this means is that if you're on the side of the road with the GUI and the graphics, you can cross over to the other side. You can see what's going on in the geometry. You can access these things. But on the other hand, if you're in, over here on the geometry side, you, you can't see, this is an impenetrable wall. You can't communicate to the graphics and the GUI. And this, this is very important architecturally. And this includes any source files or any headers. If you're working on something that's in the geometry core, you cannot include any source files or any headers or use any functions or methods 
from the graphics or from the GUI. These things do not exist to you. You only exist over here. Whereas if you're in the GUI or in the graphics and you need something from geometry, you can just kind of reach across and take it. So there's this asymmetry in the design that's important and it goes all the way through to things like header visibility, function visibility, and where we go from there. These colors up here in this top represent the main directories. So anything that's this light blue, which is util, geom core, and CFD mesh, these three really exist on the geometry side. They can't see 3D graphics or GUI, but they can be seen by them. Oh, and XML VSP. Whereas this, this hot pink GUI and draw is the GUI code in this, I don't know, tan, whatever it is, VSP graphic is the 3D graphics code. So those can see across that way. The things I've left out is the Geom API and the VSP directories themselves. They're actually both kind of small. And what VSP really does is all it provides is the main entry point. So you know any C or C++ program, if you've ever done any of that kind of programming, every program must have a main method or a main function. And so that's pretty much all that's in this VSP directory is the different mains. And we have different ones in VSP. We've got the main VSP executable that everybody runs, but some people, and so it's main exists in that directory, but it has to obviously have access to the graphics and the GUI because you've used those. But then there's also VSP batch, and that is sort of the script only version of VSP. And its main file still exists in this directory, but it does not have access to the graphics in the GUI. And if you look at it, VSP batch can be run on a high performance computer with no graphics support. And then we've got some API things that go with this and um, some tests that again, these mains are separated up. And the API has to cross this line. So anything in white, there's some dancing around in those files as to whether they allow you to access the GUI or not. Um, whereas anything in the blue, you just can't access it at all. And then in the, in the pink and the graphics, you can. So that's sort of an overall design that's, that's fundamental to things that show up. We have some things that I'll call built-in libraries. I know I'm abusing these terms a little bit, but basically util and XML VL, VSP are a collection of utilities and things that we use in house. And they're pretty much just set up like a little library. XML VSP is just a small number of simple wrappers that make it easier for us to use libxml2. VSP doesn't really have an XML schema or an XML file format in the traditional sense. There's no document where you can go and I can tell somebody else, here's how to read a VSP file. And that's kind of a broken concept, the way VSP is designed, in that the file is incredibly dynamic. Uh, Things, are, things can be added or removed from the file all the time. Things like those custom components, that engine that Nat showed yesterday, you know, I have no idea what parameters she built into her model, but that model has to be able to be represented in the file. So the file itself is dynamic. So when you're working with VSP, don't read and write the XML file directly. There's some legacy applications where people have done this. They think they're very clever but it's a really a terrible idea. It's not meant for that, strongly discouraged. Don't read and write the XML file. If you wanna interact with VSP closely, use the API, communicate that way, you're gonna be a lot happier with yourself. There's also the util directory and that has a whole bunch of small classes. The most commonly used things are our point or vector class, vec3d and vec2d, a transformation matrix class, our sort of underlying curve classes, VSP curve and VSP surf. There's a message manager. I'm, I'm not gonna have time to get into that. And then something that is what moves the draw objects, the 3D graphics information around. There's a lot more, there's actually about 30, maybe, maybe more than that things in util, but these are the most commonly used. You're gonna see a whole bunch of things that we call managers across the open VSP source. Um, here I'm just using generically, I'm calling it Foo Manager. That's not real, but we use managers a lot. And if you're familiar with C++ programming or object-oriented programming, this they're really what we call a singleton. It's a design pattern. And it kind of works like a big global variable. And each manager is, is a place where you can put a bunch of data that then is gonna be accessible from anywhere 
almost anywhere in VSP. So things like the vehicle model itself or accessing all the parameters or advanced links, a lot of these things have their own manager. And <clears throat> there's a bunch of them. And they follow this kind of a pattern where, again, this is only something only C++ people could love, but it just sets up a singleton. You'll access it through this define down here where foo manager then returns manager singleton get instance, which calls here, we've got a static singleton instance. So there will only ever be one of them. And we return a reference to that. So it acts like a pointer. You treat this like a pointer. You use a, a dash and an arrow after it to, to reference from it. You can't, the constructors don't work. The destructors don't work, but they're going to be available everywhere. And you don't have to create them anywhere. The first time somebody uses them, they'll get created on the fly. So we use a lot of managers. And if you see something that's a manager, that's what's going on with it. The directory GUI and draw, this is really what does, handles all the buttons and sliders and pull down menus and things like that, in open VSP. And if you're familiar with GUI design theory, there's something called model view container. Um, I'm sorry, model view controller. MVC is a standard design program in how GUIs are done in, in an event-driven object-oriented environment. And we do that too. And I would say that GUI and draw is where the view and controller part of model view controller happens, where the model is over in GM core. And again, the model is often done in very, via singletons so that they're always available from every place. There's gonna be a lot of update methods and the, the view in particular goes through and updates the view. And what you wanna think about here, what I'm trying to express is you may think that the best way, if somebody goes in and, and they move one slider and they adjust one parameter, you may think the best thing to do is to go back and as that slider is moved, to update just the value that goes with that one slider. You know, if they if they drag a slider from, from aspect ratio and it was four and they drag it to six, you may think, oh, I only want to go through and update the box that says six. And that would be a very fine grained update. But what it would mean is you would need custom special code for every single box, for every single parm in how to update it. And so we don't do that. Instead, when you update a view, it's essentially more of a slash and burn. And what that means is every time a GUI update gets called, that means we update the entire GUI. We start at the beginning and we go all the way through and every single field is updated every single time. Um, and there's actually an update loop in VSP that could be happening 30 times a second. So it happens real fast, um, but we don't do a fine grained update. We don't try and get too cute. We just go through and update the whole thing. The GUI itself, it, the layout of the buttons, the sliders, the windows, that's done in code. So if you're at all familiar with, with GUI design, you'll know that there's sort of two ways to do it. You can either write code that says, you know, I want a button here, I want it this wide, I want it this X, Y. Or there's sort of drawing programs where you can go in and you can drag and drop and change the size and arrange a GUI in a, in a graphical, what you see is what you get drawing program. FLTK supports that. FLTK's drawing program for that is called Fluid, and it creates something called .fl files. And that's how Kinney does it over for the VSP viewer. He uses Fluid with FL files to draw that GUI, and then you run Fluid and it actually generates C++ source code that then gets compiled and becomes that GUI. On the VSP side of things, we don't use Fluid. We used to in version two, but in version three, and it took a long time to get rid of the last uses of Fluid, but we actually draw, we make all of our GUIs programmatically. And so every button is added with an add button command. And this has really made it a lot easier to maintain and for consistency as things go forward. So all this stuff is in GUI and draw. The things, the main classes you need to know about in GUI and draw is we have this GUI device class, and that's all of our buttons and sliders and pull downs. These are all of the widgets from FLTK, but they've been enhanced to sort of know about OpenBSP's framework and how parameters work and how things work in OpenBSP. So the GUI devices are our widgets. Group layout is the class that we use to lay them out into a GUI. So the thing that's gonna position and help size our buttons, that's all done there in group layout. 
Screen base is our basic screen class. If you're making a screen, you're going to inherit from that and build from there. And Geom screen is implemented in there as well. So the main Geom screen that has things like um, the general tab and the X form tab and the, the subsurface tab, all of that's implemented in Geom screen and screen base. Screen manager is the owner, right? It owns all the screens in VSP. So that's where they're all called from and that's where updates originate from. You know, when we when screens need updating, we tell screen manager to update screens and it goes through and it looks which screens are currently visible and it tells all of them to update. Main VSP screen is the big window on the left that, you know, has the pull down menus for file and view and window and analysis and, and things like that. So that's where all of those pull down menus are set up. Uh, manage Geom screen is the one that is always open when you open that's paired with it when you start VSP. And that's the one that has the tree viewer in there that you can select which Geom you're using, you know, show, no show, hide, shade, all those things are in the manage Geom screen. Uh, the main GL window is sort of the 3D graphics portal that gets placed inside the main VSP screen. So if you're looking at anything 3D graphics, you can kind of start there for where to look. And then in this directory, there's a whole lot of screen files. You know, I call them foo screen because there's going to be wing screen, pod screen, geom screen, you know, uh, VSP arrow screen projected area screen, right? Everything's got a screen. There's going to be many of them, and each one is the implementation of the screen for that particular feature. The 3D graphics is OpenGL stuff, and that's all pretty much located in the VSP graphic directory. And this provides the interface between our code and your graphics card hardware, and that's done via OpenGL. The bad news is that OpenGL is being deprecated by pretty much everybody. It's being replaced by Direct3D on Windows, Metal on Mac, and Vulkan everywhere else. And that's a challenge because if people really go through with deprecating this, then VSP is going to need a major rewrite of the graphics subsystem in order to keep working. And um, that terrifies me. That's, that's going to be big and scary. Right now, OpenGL is still working, but we need to worry about that down the road. Um, the way this communication works, there's sort of a handful of things on the, and this is in the Geom core side of things. There's a bunch of methods you'll see called update draw obj. And what those do is they get called by the Geom zone update. This is what sort of does the math to set up the mesh that gets visualized. And this is what positions those points that OpenGL is going to, to look at. And when these are changed, it's going to set a flag, MGM changed, it's going to set that flag to true. Now, VSP GL window, we just talked about it. When it gets, when its update gets called, it's going to call load draw obj across a bunch of places. And that load draw obj is going to update the GL window. It's going to load all that data and transfer it over to the video card. And once it's done, it's going to set that GM change to false. And so, you know, if it ever notices that the geom changed has that the geom has not been changed, then it's not going to transfer the data. So this is an optimization that means that if we if we haven't changed the wing, we don't transfer the wing every time. Load draw obj gets implemented all over the place, and what it does is it transfers the draw obj that was created by the update draw obj, and that's just it's the collector. It's like a garbage man going along and picking up draw obj at every address in your street. Um, Load draw obj can make small adjustments. You can't change the bulk shape, but for example, you can change if it was shaded versus wireframe or change the color. You can do that in, in load draw obj, and it'll be faster if you do it there than doing a full update draw obj with the geom change true. Um, VSP GL window, uh, the underscore update, which gets called by the main update, that's what actually goes through and creates uh, entities on the OpenGL side that correspond to every draw object. So this is really what transfers things to the memory of the video card. Uh, every draw object that we have, it says it has a geom ID 
it's not really a GM ID, but it is a unique identifier. It's a unique identifier. And the reason we do that is when we transfer some draw obj to the video card, we need a way coming back later to see if it's the same draw obj. So we give it this unique ID and that allows us to come back and check to see if it's been updated or not. So that ID needs to be unique and we're gonna use that in conjunction with the geom change true false flags. And then that geom change flag is really the flag that tells us to trigger the bulk updated data. So that's that's how that'll trigger. And this is, this is kind of how the how we communicate from the core subsystems over to the graphics card. Most of these classes, you're gonna find draw obj is in util, and that's just this little transport carrier. Uh, in VSP graphic entities, that's what actually goes through and does the drawing. And scene is what does the drawings in the scene. So the low level drawing is drawn by entity and scene handles drawing everything as a whole. So that's sort of the, the top level where to go look for where stuff is happening there. Okay, there's the CFD mesh directory. Um, and while it's called CFD mesh, that's kind of historical reasons. It's, uh, it's where we have all the code for the CFD mesh, FEA mesh, and the trim surfaces for the trim surfaces output to CAD that uh, Justin talked about the other day. And there's sort of two main algorithms that happen in here. One is the surface-surface intersection of the smooth Bezier surfaces. And then we also have our isotropic surface mesh generator. And you know those are sort of two core algorithms, two really hard things to do that exist in this directory. And then we use them in different ways in order to make the CFD mesh, FEA mesh, and trim surfaces utilities that the user can use. Historically, go back a long time, all these files were a part of Geom Core. We haven't talked about that yet, but it's up soon. But we, we separated them out to declutter things. They, so now they're in their own directory. Um, but we need more of that. We need more of this kind of separation. And really, it'd be a great idea to turn CFD Mesh into a standalone library so that it could be called separately and it could have its own main and its own tests to really help us improve our unit testing and improve its reliability. So that's something that needs to happen um, as we mature. Um, it's gonna take a bunch of work, so I'm not, I'm not sure where the time, the resources will come for that, but you know, keep your eye out that these things need to be refactored and separated out. Okay, GM Core is everything else, right? This is, you may be wondering where's, where's all the big stuff? Well, it's kind of all dumped here in GM Core. And like, like I said with CFD Mesh, it would be great to separate a bunch of this into other subdirectories to clean it up, uh, separate it off, and where possible, refactor some of it into libraries uh, with their own APIs and the ability to make their own tests uh, to improve the quality of that code. I'm gonna break this <clears throat> into, there's sort of five groups of classes and functions in here. There's things that I would call sort of boilerplate infrastructure. There's the scaffolding that makes it all work. There's the geometry itself. Um, there's things that kind of relate to the modeling tab in the menu um, for manipulating a model and, and making models smart. There's things that relate to the analysis pull down in the menu that allow us to do different algorithms and analysis on things. And then there's kind of some, some other stuff that doesn't fit this taxonomy, just everything else that we can toss in, like lighting and measures and textures and custom geoms and other stuff. So we're going to talk through some of this here, um, not in tremendous detail, but hopefully it'll give a flavor of, of what all is in there. In terms of infrastructure, what you need to know, there's something called a PARM, and that's a class. You'll find the PARM files in there. And that represents the parameter that we vary itself. So every parameter in VSP, whether it's sweep, taper, exposition, twist, you know, fineness ratio, skinning variables, all those things are PARMs. Every slider you move, you're adjusting a PARM. And the PARM has to know it's, you know, it's lower limit, it's upper unit limit, it's name, it's group, it's value. You know, all these things are known by a PARM. They also have unique IDs and that unique ID is um, what allows us to do things like fit model and design variables and other things because we don't always have to keep track of a PARM by you know its its full address. We can just talk about it 
by using its unique ID, and that's really powerful. More of the infrastructure is something we call a PARM container, and a PARM container is something that has a bunch of PARMs. So the vehicle model itself, uh, geoms are PARM containers, sometimes different managers for like, you know, the VSP Aero GUI, there'll be a PARM container there. So it's a thing that <clears throat> has a bunch of PARMs. It also has a unique ID. So each geom has a unique ID and uh, we use that a lot. PARM manager, right? This is what keeps track of all the PARMs. All the PARMs ultimately are, are tracked by the PARM manager. And if you want a PARM and you want to, and you know its ID, you can ask PARM manager for it and it'll send you back a pointer to that PARM. Vehicle is sort of the overall model. It is a PARM container. Um, it's accessible through a singleton. You can only have one vehicle at a time. And that's what keeps <clears throat> any data that doesn't re that belongs to the model, but that doesn't belong to a geom ends up in vehicle. Now, when a PARM is changed, when you change the value, it doesn't call update immediately. Instead, it's going to call the PARM container that it's in. It's going to call that PARM container's PARM changed. And so we're now notifying its PARM that it was changed. So you can imagine this means that if, if you change sweep angle, then it's going to notify the wing so that it knows, hey, wing, your sweep angle changed. And it's then going to set a flag that we call this late update flag. And maybe we should change the name of this to needs update flag. What we mean here is, is we've quote unquote dirtied the geometry. We've said, look, it's no longer up to date. It needs to be updated later in order to be up to date. So we set that late update flag to true. And then later down through something else in the code, an update cycle is gonna happen and it's gonna go through looking through the model, looking for things that need to be updated. It's gonna do that update and when it does so, it's gonna set late update bag back to false so that we know we're current. And this is really important. You can imagine when you load a VSP3 file at the beginning, there's thousands of PARMs in that file. And if after every PARM was updated, every, every PARM was set as we read in the file, if we issued an update, that would mean that reading a file in for the first time would trigger thousands of updates and it would take forever long. So instead, what we can do is we can sort of batch these updates together. Every PARM that's read in from the file, it sets late update flag to true but we don't trigger an update until we're done reading in the file. And then once we're done, we say, let it rip, fire off all the updates, and it goes through and everything gets updated. So that's what's going on there to, to keep things efficient. Okay, more hey, Rob, real quick, <clears throat> while we're on the subject of PARM manager and container, uh, Jason's asking why, how PARM container and PARM manager uh, differ from each other. So, there can be lots of PARM containers. The vehicle is a PARM container. Every geom is a PARM container. If a geom is something made up of multiple XX, then there's going to be an XX surf in there that's a PARM container. And each XX is a PARM container. And each XX has an XX curve. And each XX curve is a PARM container. So a PARM container is just something that has its own little PARMs. Whereas PARM manager is... It doesn't actually have any PARMs itself. It's sort of like the watcher, right? It keeps track of all the PARMs. It knows where they all are. It knows all their pointers, but it doesn't have any of its own. So <laughs> back in the old days, long ago, analysis tools were added to VSP in an ad hoc basis. Every time we'd add an analysis tool, whether it was CompGeom or Area Slice, things like that, each one, <clears throat> we would just go into the API and we'd like, oh, we need CompGeom in the API. Let's go add, you know, run CompGeom to the API. Let's go add run slice to the API. And each one has its own parameters and has its own output. And this was all done in an ad hoc way that each one made sense for its own function. It made sense for CompGeom, for area slice, or for whatever what it was. But there was no commonality. There wasn't a standard way of doing this. And as we grew and as we added a bunch of analysis types, it became clear that we needed a unified approach. We needed one way to talk to all these analyses. And what we did was we came up with sort of a couple of layers. First off, we're gonna to talk to these analyses 
through a name value pair system. So any input value, say we're we're sending VSP Arrow the mock number, we're gonna have a list of inputs, VSP Arrow inputs, and we could say VSP Arrow, hey, what are your inputs? And it's gonna come back and it's gonna give us a list of names. And one of them will be mock. <clears throat> and it's got a name that we can interact with, we can search, we can read, and then a value that we can set. So we can tell, you know, VSP Arrow, we can say, hey, you know, what's your mock number? Set the value to 0.6. Um, and so this name name value data and name value collection are the two classes that work with this. And these are the low level classes that let us work with this kind of um, information. And if you're a if you're a Python person, you might call this a a um, a dictionary, uh, where a name value collection is really the dictionary and a name value data is a single element in a dictionary. Now then what we do is the outputs, when we take all the outputs from an analysis, we put them all into a results class. And that results class is a name value collection. And, but then there's a, a master results manager that holds them all. So there's the results manager class. When you run an analysis, it creates a results, it throws it over there in the results manager class and it dumps that out. And so through the API, you can access any results from any analysis that's run through the results manager. And then likewise, there's an analysis manager that manages all the analysis tools. And to add a new analysis to VSP, you really only have to implement two methods, which is basically something that sets the default values and something that tells it to run. And of course, when it runs and executes, it returns back an ID to a unique results object. So if you're working on adding an analysis to VSP, these are the things you need to look at. You need to go to the analysis manager. You need to tell the analysis manager that your new analysis exists. So you have to register the built-ins and then you write that execute so that it'll create results. And then everything should be hooked up for that to work. Okay, I, I realize I've gone long, but I, I hope everybody's finding this useful. I'm gonna keep going power through. Um, now we're getting into the nitty gritty, if, <laughs> if you think that's possible. So at the core of everything, where sort of the real magic happens, where the math happens, that turns a um, that turns a set of parameter values into a shape that a user sees, that really happens in the update method of geom. So if you're going to write your own geom, and if you want to change a geom, change its behavior you're going to need to come in and you're going to need to make changes to geom update. And so first we'll talk a little bit about the classes. A geom itself is <clears throat> derived from, it is a geom X form, which is derived from a geom base, which is derived from a parm container. So to Jason's question, a parm container is a, is a base class that a geom is derived from. And we've implemented some of the base and transformation functions of a geom in these levels and then everything else is here in geom. And so that's sort of the main geometry class, base class that if you're implementing your own geometry, you'll probably start from. And then it's got this method update, which handles most of the work. That's where most of the heavy lifting of being a geom is done. And this was recently changed in 3.22. I made some major changes to geom update to make it smarter about the work and you know, I talked about doing a fine grained or coarse grained update earlier with respect to the GUI. Essentially what we did here was I went through and I tried to make geom update more fine grained. And what this does is it made it a lot faster and I've been calling these the new faster update changes, but it had a lot of risk. And frankly, it, it introduced a bunch of bugs. I think we've finally got most of them chased out, but that's the trade-off, right, is we've added more code complexity, and with that came bugs, uh, but the code complexity was able to, frankly, we also need more memory. We use more memory, but we then also get higher performance. So that was all done. If you go into geom update, you're going to see there's a geom base method, and it is called set dirty flags. And what we do, rather than go to perfectly fine-grained, right? You can imagine um, a, a fine-grained update would know 
what is the minimum things that need to be done if I change one parameter, right? If one parameter changes, what needs to be updated? What's the minimum things to still get a consistent answer? And figuring that out on a individual parameter by parameter basis, parm by parm, would be would be incredibly challenging. And we're not equipped for that. We didn't design VSP for that. So instead, what I did when I made faster update, my observation was that I could kind of group update changes. I could group them. And so there's certain PARMs that affect the position, rotation, and symmetry of a geom, but without changing its actual shape. And there's other PARMs that affect the tessellation, the wireframe tessellation, and the clustering of the representation on screen, but they don't affect anything else. They don't affect its position, orientation, or symmetry, and they don't affect the underlying shape. And then there's other PARMs that affect the shape itself, um, that affect the wingspan, the, the airfoil shape, and, and basically anything else, right? It's a catch-all. Anything else goes into that. And so what we can do is when PARM changed is run, PARM changed for a geom, we'll call geom based set dirty flags and set dirty flags is is like the triage nurse it looks at each parm and it figures out and this is basically manual code it figures out is this parm that changed should it is it an x form dirty should it mark that as changing the transformations should it mark it as changing the tessellation or should it mark it as changing the surface itself so this is the triage to classify any PARM. And that'll go through and, and propagate that information. And, and just ignore this little bit down here. Um, well, I guess I'll talk about it. There's there's something in update called, I think it's on the next slide, update surf. Yeah, we'll, I'll assume it's on the next slide. We'll come back if we don't. So that's what's going on in Geom update with faster update is we have to triage these every PARM so that then update can only update the things that need to be updated. It, update surf is where the particular math for your given component, for your given geom is implemented. So much of what happens for a geom, you can imagine things like positioning it 3D space and handling symmetry and its color, all of these things, those are all the same, right? They're all generic for any geom and you don't need to implement that code over and over again. So that's all updated, that's all handled in geom update, but an individual, a particular geom, whether it's a wing or a stack or a body of revolution, any foo geom needs to update its surface. And this is where the particular math that's particular to a propeller or to a pod or to a fuselage, that's where it is implemented. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the real core to a surface is, how do you turn PARMs into a surface is for a geom is here in update surf. And what its job is, is it populates this main surf spec. Okay. Its job is to do the math and populate main surf spec. And main surf spec contains a single copy of the geometry with no symmetry applied and no transformation. So it's at the origin, aligned with the axes, a single copy of all the surfaces of a geometry and, and all the built-in surfaces really only have one surf, right? There's only one surf for a wing, but some of the custom geoms, if you think about something like Podman and, you know, seat, there's the back of the seat and then there's the, there's the butt of the seat. So there's actually two main surfaces in this surface vac, um, but there's only one copy of it, right? It has not been transformed or positioned in space. But that's really what update surf does is it is it lofts the surface and puts that there. And under the hood, main surf vec is an STL vector of VSP surfs. VSP surf exists in util. We talked about that earlier. Um, under the hood of VSP surf, the actual math is VSP surf has a member variable called M surface, which is a piecewise surface type. For those of you that love templated code, a piecewise surface type is a type def. Here you can see piecewise surface type. It's really from code Eli. Remember I said that there's that 
that math and surface library that's where all the low level stuff happens. So that's code Eli and it's a, a namespace haven. So in an Eli geom surface piecewise, which is templated to use Eli geom surface Bezier surface patches based on double variables in three dimensions, because we exist in three dimensions, is a piecewise surface type. So the low level math is really handled by this piecewise surface type, which again is, is, a, is a member of a VSP surf, which then there's a vector of those that are the main surface vec. And then we've got this method called apply symmetry, apply sim, that takes a vector, which is the main surface vec, and it applies the symmetry and transformation things to make all of the copies. So it copies main surface vec to create surface vec. So that's where it goes through to make all of those symmetrical copies as we apply sim to main surface vec to then go to surface vec. And we actually use apply sim a couple of other places as well. Uh, okay. We've had a question pop up here in the chat uh, regarding the triage system of whether it spawns separate threads for the jobs and if they run parallel or if this is more of a, uh, a different app implementation. No, this is all single threaded. Um, this whole bit, the only places where VSP itself uses threads is we'll spawn a thread for some of our analyses. So when we, when we run VSP arrow, we'll spawn a thread for that. We'll actually spawn a thread for CFD mesh and for FEA mesh um, so that those things can kind of go off and run on their own. But the core of VSP itself is all single threaded. So that's um, that that. Yeah, I can't imagine trying to make all this thread safe. That'd be it was not designed that way from the start. So it, I don't know how we'd have to do that. OK, good question, though. OK, if you find yourself in the position where you want to add a geom. You want to add something to VSP and you want to add your own geom. The places you're going to be working is in geom core and in GUI and draw. And you need to know about the geom that's the main base class. But so to implement foo geom, your favorite thing, you need to inherit classes, both one from geom and one from geom screen. So you're going to you're going to make foo geom and you're going to inherit from geom and you're going to make foo screen inherit from geom screen. And then you need to implement these methods. And there's only, what is this, nine of them? This is really, this is basically it. This is all you really have to do to add a geom. Um, you have to make a constructor and the constructor is where you tell it what farms there are. You know, if you're, if you're adding a new, you know, satellite dish component and you want it to have a diameter and a height, that's where you tell satellite dish geom that the farms it has are, are diameter and height. You have to write update surf, and that's what takes the math for diameter and height, and it makes it into a M surface vec. There's a compute center, which is really trivial. These are only like three lines long typically, but you notice there's a um, there's an ability to change the center of rotation on most geoms, and so this is just where you're telling it. You just come back with an X Y Z of where where is that center of rotation relative to the body. And so that's what Compute Center does. There's a scale method. So I've talked about how the best way to design a component is with, with one dimensional variable, one thing that sets the scale, and all the other parameters as much as possible are all non-dimensional and scaled from that. What the scale method does is it comes in and if you're, it, it makes your, your object, it, it has to know which things are scale and which things are non-dimensional and it's going to ignore the non-dimensional but any of your parms set up up in the constructor scale is going to go through and if it's a dimensional thing then it's going to and you tell it to scale by two then it multiplies it by two so this is what this is where the smarts to know that we scale lengths but we don't scale angles and we don't scale ratios so the lengths get scaled right here add default sources uh, CFD mesh has a button that any geom can have default sources added. This is optional. You don't have to implement it, but if you want default sources, this is where you come and you can make that happen. Somewhat similarly, if you want your geom to work well with conformal geometry, then this is where you come and you tell conformal geometry how to offset your surface and how to reloft it. So 
when conformal geom works, it, it kind of makes an underhanded copy of the geom. Let's say it's a wing. We make an underhanded copy of the wing, and then we go through and we do the math to say, okay, at each cross section, how would you shrink that cross section to make it conformal? And that math is done in offset cross sections. Um, and when Brandon says that that uh, that a that a propeller's conformal geom doesn't work very well, that's because I was lazy and I didn't do a good job of writing offset XX propeller because I didn't think anybody would be crazy enough to offset a propeller. Um, Brandon, of course, was, so maybe that needs to be done better. But I didn't think about using a propeller as a cutting surface the way he does. I was thinking that nobody would put a fuel tank inside a propeller. Um, so, you know, you have to worry about your assumptions about your users. Uh, yeah, once you've like done all that, that's pretty much Brandon. On the GM side, uh, on the screen side, you have to set up a constructor. So the constructor is what goes through the GUI devices and the, um, the that layout that I talked about, and it's what adds all the buttons and labels and sets it up to make your GUI look pretty. So you have to add a constructor, and then you add an update method, and that's just what goes through. And you can really think of the update method as being the pairing between this button that you added that you put the label sweep next to and the sweep parameter. You have to associate all the parms with the buttons. And so that's what the update does. There's a bunch of boilerplate. There's some, you know, there's some plumbing and some connections that you have to make that are scattered around that you have to do to make all this work. But in terms of real work to actually implement a geom, this is it. This is all you have to do. Um, when you do this, you should do what I basically always do. And I start, if I'm adding a geom, I copy and paste pod geom. And I copy and then I go through and I change all the names so that instead of pod geom, it's now foo geom. And I make it foo screen. And I get everything working. I, I go through and I make everything work. I change everything from pod to foo. And when I'm done with that and it compiles and runs and I can do that, I usually make a git commit. And now I know that all my boilerplate is in place, right? I've got all that done. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And now I can just focus on these sort of eight methods that are the real crux of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, likewise, if you want to do this, go study Podgeom. You'll see that everything I'm talking about here um, is on the order of maybe 100 lines of code. It's really quite simple. All right. We're getting to the end. Um, there are some geoms that are more complicated than that. Um, so, you know, some geoms like pod are sort of standalone shapes. They do their own thing. Whereas some geoms like wing, stack, and fuselage, you notice that we have this collection and prop. We have this collection of cross sections. And so VSP has a class called geomxsec which inherits from geom. And what geom exec does is it then contains, it has an exec surf that then is a container for exec. And what exec surf lets you do is that is the boilerplate code to allow you to cut, copy, paste, delete, and work with exec in a generic way. And then an exec surf is itself a parm container, but it also it has it, an exec surf as a container. It has a bunch of execs where each of those execs is what handles the positioning, the rotating and translating of a cross section for that. So there's a different way of doing that for a fuselage, a stack, a wing, and a prop, right? Each one of these contains its own sort of exec class that is, is the specialization. And that's what allows a wing to position the next exec based on taper, sweep, aspect ratio, span, whereas a stack positions the next one just based on X, Y, Z, rotation X, Y, Z. And that's handled by the exec. Then the curve shape itself, the exec class, again, handles the positioning of it. It also has an exec curve class. And so that exec curve is kind of like a 2D version of a geom. That's what contains, that's what knows about the 2D shape, whether it's a rounded rectangle or a circle or a NACA four digit airfoil. Exec curve is what does that 2D version of a shape. It's also a PARM container, 
So, you know, that NACA airfoil knows about thickness and camber, and it then creates its update function, basically turns the PARM values into a VSP curve. So that's how these are added. And then exit curve is sort of generic, and we do points, ellipses, and rounded rectangles, whereas there's actually airfoils, which are a specialization of that, and that's specialized because it knows about cord and thickness to cord instead of width and height. And so all of our airfoil types are implemented as airfoil classes. Oops, and I know that this has been a, a fire hose, um, but hopefully that's a, a tour through OpenVSP. I'm happy to answer any more questions, and if if anybody's really for it, I could go and, and show some source if anybody wanted to look at pod and how that works or something like that, um, but I'll take any questions now. All right, well, lots of information. Um, appreciate you walking through, and I mean, it, I learned a lot from that and taking a look at how to build uh, geometries and, and things. And I'm, the nice thing is that uh, the virtual workshop here has us um, recording all of this stuff, so I won't forget it in you know two months after I get caught up with other things. I can always go back and look at this and see it again. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to to go with that. Um, I don't see any Q and A on the IO page and. Uh, it looks like we've answered all the questions from the live chat uh, over here. Okay, I guess then just the last thing I'll say is um, is if you want, first I want to encourage people. It, it's big, it's, it's 300,000 lines of code, but I want to encourage people. It's not that bad. Things are pretty well defined and separated. It's not that bad to dive in. It's way easier today to make changes than it was back in version two, even though the code is much more, much bigger and much more complicated today. So don't be afraid of it. Um, I see a lot of grad students in particular, but I see other researchers who are trying to accomplish things in VSP that would be a lot easier if they just open the hood and make a few changes. Um, you know they're they're trying to fight the system or work around problems or you know make it do something that the developers never anticipated and you know in a lot of cases it'd be a lot easier to just make it happen so i encourage you know the grad students out there that are doing their thesis and trying to use vsp uh don't be don't be totally intimidated you know open the hood make it yours uh make some modifications see what you can do uh, the other thing i'll say is if you know what you want to do, if you know what you kind of modification you want to do, um, you know, post a message on the Google group and ask where to start. You know, this this presentation hopefully will provide a, a top level view. But usually if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z, then I'm going to be able to come in and um, I'm going to be able to tell them, OK, you want to look at this class and this file. Maybe you want to update this subroutine so I can. I can probably point you where you want to go and where you want to get started. And, you know, in my experience, when somebody's getting started in VSP, um, that's the hardest part is figuring out where to start. And um, I, frankly, I'd estimate I, I've taught uh, a number of people. I have brought them up to speed and got them current and good at developing in VSP. And I'd say that simply asking me where to start on a typical project will probably save you the first two weeks. Um, that if you if you don't have this tour and if you don't know where to start, it'll take you two weeks to to sort of figure out where you should do things. And and I can probably tell you that in about five minutes. So don't be afraid to ask. I'm happy to help people get them started and save you that two weeks and get you started off to a, to a good start from the beginning. <laughs>